sorry I have to substitute for Chris under these circumstances. Um, but uh, it's been great fun working with him and his colleagues and being part of this expanding discussion, um, which is really kind of the, uh, the, the undertone of, of today's conversation. What uh, I and the other speakers will be covering appears to be a really interesting convergence on uh, identification of a problem and exploration of solutions in really pragmatic ways. And uh, knowing the conservation community, that pragmatism is, isn't a particularly big surprise. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm very excited to uh, to see the discussion that that bringing together this uh, this group of practitioners and researchers will will uh, will spark. And uh, that tone of pragmatism is something that I think we all want to carry through. And when, I, when Chris and I were, were debriefing yesterday about this, um, that's something that he wanted to, to, to really um, see if we can, we can promote as, uh, as strongly as we can. This is an ongoing conversation. Uh, it's an open conversation and it is far from over. So um, if uh, those of you participating and viewing and listening, if you have ideas or questions, um, this, is, this is part of that process. Uh, just a quick word about my own background. Um, I am uh, in large measure a social scientist, but uh, I also work across fields and I've been using remote cameras for a decade now in Arctic and subarctic environments uh, for an endeavor that uh, launched on Zooniverse just a few months ago called the Arctic Bears Project, which is a citizen science project to, uh, to understand changing carnivore ecology uh, in a very, very rapidly warming ecosystem. Um, what we want to cover collectively today are uh, an introduction to the issues and principles for socially responsible use of conservation technology. Uh, Trishant is going to dive deep into uh, the question of how conservation tech can cause harm. And spoiler, uh, when Trishant first told me about his research and what he was finding, my jaw hit the floor. Um, I didn't think I was particularly naive about the kind of issues that uh, that uh, conservation technology could potentially trip into, um, but I was. Uh, Laura is then going to uh, expand on how you can tackle these in issues in a larger organizational context, um, and I'm 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 very excited to hear from her on this. This is uh, th this is where we hope that this discussion will go into larger spaces. Uh, Kostub, uh, a new colleague who. He and his team, uh, it turns out, were converging on many of the ideas that uh, Chris and I and Trishant and our colleagues were working on. Uh, and Kostub and his colleagues uh, put out a wonderful paper on ethics and remote camera use uh, about the same time uh, that our paper on uh, identifying some principles came out. And the principles are, are remarkably common. So we're just thrilled at, at, uh, at the convergence in ideas and thinking about practices here. And he'll wrap up with uh, uh, some very empirical observations about how to tackle these issues in the field. A little bit of a background. Um, conservation sector is, is advancing and adopting an enormous range of tools that's growing just all the time. Uh, my own bet for some of the really interesting areas next are things like environmental genomics in real time. But drones, camera traps, which many of us use, sensor networks, trackers, bioacoustics, uh, an area of, of, of rapid growth that Steph uh, tuned me into. And in parallel with this, we see new software, uh, new analytic tools, and, and big data, of course, uh, and social media. And together, these, these um, are, have just utterly transformed the technological landscape of conservation. Uh, there are three main applications that, uh, that, that, are, that are apparent so far. Uh, obviously for research and monitoring of animals and, and biophysical parameters, uh, doing direct conservation work, catching people involved in illegal activities, acting as a deterrent, uh, and for engaging the public. Um, the images and the data that come from drones, remote cameras, and, and these new technologies are, are really exciting and have amazing communication potential. They're very evocative. Uh, and, and of course, citizen science enables people to engage at a whole different level and internet enabled platforms like Zooniverse um, create an enormous breadth of opportunity for such engagement. Uh, Chris and his group have uh, over time really led some of the, 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 the thinking and the development of a theoretical basis 
for thinking about the social impacts of conservation monitoring. Uh, there are various ways in which people can be monitored, uh, both deliberately, as we've just discussed, and in, in, in many particular applications that many of you are, are judging by the chat, quite familiar with. Um, but then there's also this question of accidental or human bycatch <clears throat> observation of people where people trigger camera traps intended for wildlife uh, <laughs> deliberately or otherwise, thinking of some of my friends, um, uh, overflying of homes, farms, communities, uh, and all kinds of other issues. Um, when, I, when I started to learn what acoustic uh, um, monitoring tools can do, I started thinking about conversations I've had on apartment balconies in, uh, in, uh, in times past and thinking, hmm, do I really want that listened to? So, Chris and others, as I mentioned, have, uh, have put out a, a really nice, um, uh, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, almost a body of literature now that, that uh, is becoming increasingly deep in its thinking about potential social and ethical implications. And I want to stress that these are both positive as well as negative. Um, empowerment, security, th there's an awful lot of good as well as just the, the um, you know, the, the, the pure scientific and conservation data that these uh, that these uh, technologies uh, produce. Um, I'm working with community deployed remote cameras right now in, in, in the Arctic and subarctic, and uh, I, I can see some of these empowerment benefits firsthand. Um, negative, invasion of privacy. Um, fear of what might be done with the data and what the devices actually do. Uh, excuse me, cultural impacts. There's a growing body of evidence that shows that social impacts are real and they can be quite significant. And as, <clears throat> excuse me, Trishant will show us, uh, these can lead to real harm. Excuse me, just one more. <clears throat> so our goal in the webinar here is not to, you know, not to, 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 to make people feel negatively about what they may be doing, but to, to help expand uh, conservation technology users' thoughts uh, and, and, uh, and ultimately their uh, all of your own approaches to um, to to what you're doing, um, and bring your ideas into the the evolving conversation about what can be done to identify and address these issues. Um, we see a need for clear ethical guidelines. As I mentioned, Costa uh, produced a set of guidelines with his colleagues in in a, in a recent paper. Um, so did we. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll just describe our ours very very briefly. Um, last year, uh, just pre-pandemic, we, uh, we brought together an interdisciplinary group to develop a set of principles, uh, which we published in Conservation Science and Practice. We used the Wild Labs uh, forums as a wonderful space to get some early in input and, uh, and feedback on our, our draft principles. Um, and our paper in Costubs, um, I would recommend for people who want to dig deeper into uh, the kinds of guidelines that, uh, that um, that that, uh, that are being looked at. Uh, and we very much encourage uptake by users, journal editors, donors, and others working in this space to, uh, um, you know, to think about adopting formally and, and, uh, and making a public position known uh, about an expectation for ethical guidelines for use of conservation technology. And, uh, and as, as this is ongoing, we do welcome feedback and suggestions. So that, uh, that's the presentation, and I will uh, I'll, uh, I'll yield the microphone, I think, to Trishant. Well, thanks, Doug. Uh, Steph, should I just uh, go directly in it? Uh, I have just one question. Um, Doug, you, and this is a question I'd like to pick up pick up in the panel discussion. And actually, I know we have some tech people in the audience, so I'd quite like to um, to to hear from you guys in in the discussion but but doug that final final slide you mentioned that you're trying to get uptake from users donors and journal editors and there seems to be like a massive missing piece there which is the tech developers and um the, thank you and yes. i was wondering what your thoughts were on that that um on that uh, had had you uh, tipped me off to that earlier, I would have added them to this list. Absolutely, we would. <laughs> I would welcome that a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Having had to sort through an awful lot of photos this past winter, where uh, I accidentally had photos of people showing up in a Zooniverse feed, um, I'd have loved some technical assistance and some 
uh, upfront automated ways to weed those out so that we didn't have to do it after the fact and manually. So that and many, many other realms, um, I'm sure developers have an enormous amount to contribute. That would be, yeah, very good point, Steph. Thank you. I think, yeah, let's pick it up in the, the actual, the bigger discussion because it was really interesting um, uh, when we published uh, the the Tech Tutors overview, like what was coming this season. One of the things that a lot of our tech audience, especially on Twitter, pulled out was the fact that we were covering ethics. Um, so this is such a live discussion in, in that realm as well. And there's, there's a lot of eagerness from that part of our community to to be a part of these conversations. So I think it's it's there's definitely willingness and and probably ways we could learn from, but also influence um, what's happening over in that sector as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, Trishant, off you go. Great. Thanks, Steph. Uh, thanks, Doug, for that wonderful uh, uh, setting the scene. And uh, I'll just get directly into it. And just before that, uh, just a very quick introduction of myself. I am uh, Trishant, and I'm a final year PhD student at the Department of Geography here at the University of Cambridge. And uh, my PhD research was uh, looking at the social and political implications, specifically impacts of using conservation technologies uh, in one specific field site in India. So I'm particularly going to talk about how some of these technologies can cause harm uh, and look at the, the politics of using these surveillance technologies on the ground. So uh, as most people uh, would know that, you know, when, whenever we kind of talk about ethics of uh, technologies, most people really think of it in terms of the risks on animals or species. Uh, but there, there are, as Doug mentioned, there are lots of uh, risks and, you know, potential pitfalls when it comes to using technologies in human dominated landscapes or where people share landscapes with, uh, with species. Uh, so I'll just share my screen. Uh, sorry, sorry about the delay, guys. Right. So, um, you know, I did my PhD fieldwork uh, at this site called as the Cobbett Tiger Reserve in Uttarakhand in India. Um, and my uh, and I picked Cobbett specifically because of its very unique history and the wide range of uh, digital surveillance technologies that are used here. Uh, it also has uh, the most dense tiger population at a single site in the world. And it was like the first national park to be declared in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, it's also very glamorous in terms of tourism. So there's a lot of tourism there and it's, uh, you know, it's got many charismatic species other than the tiger as well, like elephants uh, and a large human population that lives in the fringes of the national park. And there are four kinds of uh, prevalent conservation technologies that are used uh, in Cobet. Uh, so you've got camera traps, there are drones. Uh, in particularly in Kobe, they they are called warriors of the forest. So, so there's a drone security force that is deployed there, and uh, very uniquely, there's something called as an electronic eye system, which is uh, like a very powerful thermal camera, which has a range of about 15 kilometers, um, uh, and uh, it's deployed on the boundaries of the tiger reserve, specifically on the southern boundary. I'll come to that a little later. And uh, fourth, there's a mobile application called as M stripes that is basically used to uh, uh, you know, uh, surveil, uh, workplace of, uh, surveillance for, of forest guards and forest labor, uh, just like SMART, uh, but th this is the Indian version of SMART and it's called M-Stripes. I will not be talking much about M-Stripes, maybe we can discuss that in the questions, but I'll uh, be particularly talking about the impact that camera traps, drones, and this electronic EI system has. So what I did was I did I used ethnographic methods uh, um, and I conducted some structure and informal interviews and participant observations and focus group discussions. Um, um, I, this was pretty detailed. I spent 14 months uh, uh, situating myself in the landscape. I conducted over 270 interviews, 90 hours of participant observations and many focus group discussions. Um, and uh, my uh, my field, uh, you know, the villages that I uh, survey people, uh, th there were different kinds of villages. Uh, there were certain villages that are called revenue villages where people have land titles on their name. There are villages that are forest villages where people don't have land titles on them and are extremely dependent on um, on the on on that for their livelihood on the forest. And there are encroached sites, uh, and this is very important because. Uh, surveillance or the the impacts of the technologies is experienced in different ways according to the administrative status of the village and the social composition of these villages. So my research shows that technologies like camera traps have a very disproportionate impact on women. Uh, there is a huge gendered uh, equation. 
on this. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that uh, it is the women of the house in this state or uh, in this region uh, that go to collect firewood and grass in the forest for their daily livelihood needs. So every morning, uh, groups of young and old women would go from villages into the forest to collect grass and firewood. And during my observations, it became very clear that this traditional practice was not just to collect resources for their livelihood, but also acted as an opportunity for social interaction between women. So in a deeply patriarchal society, the forest was the only space for freedom where women would discuss village gossip or personal household stories, gossiping, gossiping about their husbands or gossiping about their mother-in-laws. And this space is often invaded by deployed camera traps, altering the behavior of women. So women also traditionally sing songs loudly while collecting forest produce. Um, and uh, whenever camera traps were around, women would actively resist singing. So this has consequences, not just uh, in terms of changing their cultural practice, uh, but the primary reason for singing very loudly is to keep large wildlife like tigers and elephants away. And that got in, and camera traps got in the way of doing that. So furthermore, camera traps often catch women in comprising, uh, you know, in compromising acts such as relieving themselves or in a position where their clothes are not in order of the accepted cultural norm. So as I, as I described in the next slide, this has very severe implications on privacy and has given rise to a case of sexual harassment in my field site as well. So let me just read out a few quotes from, from the slide. Uh, there is a converse, you know, there's a woman who's telling me that why do they, as in the state, as in the government, have to put cameras on the exact paths we take to go to the forest. When we start walking around the cameras, they force us to walk in front. Otherwise, they do not let us collect firewood. They say the tigers too will walk on the path created by us avoiding the camera traps. Uh, there's another conversation where one woman's telling me one woman's picture of relieving herself came in that camera of theirs. Instead of deleting the photo, they circulated it in their phone. So this was a major issue that uh, resulted in a case of sexual harassment of, uh, uh, you know, of a, of a woman from a marginalized community by forest guards in, in this reserve. Uh, there's also this conversation, uh, uh, which I was, you know, I was, I was a participant observation. I was listening to this where one woman says the other day he hit me. He, she's talking about her husband, uh, while the other woman says quiet, there is a camera trap attached here. So there are these, uh, uh, you know, implications that uh, traps can have. Um, so my research also shows that the use of drones in the Cobbett Tiger Reserve is completely for surveillance and not for any kind of ecological purposes or monitoring. Uh, and this surveillance actually changes in intensity according to who is being surveilled. So uh, as part of my research, I traveled with the drone team or the task force regularly in a vehicle that looked like it was straight out of the CIA or the FBI, a black vehicle, uh, you know, with, uh, with army, army kind of uh, symbolism all over it. Um, every morning, the team would drive to a village adjoining the boundary of the Tiger Reserve and in full public view, fly the drone on the boundaries of the village and the forest. Uh, this, however, changes according to the village where the surveillance is being done. For example, in the forest villages that are dominated by lower caste or marginalized groups, drones would be flown from within the villages uh, over top of people's homes. And when a crowd gathers, they would be told about how the aircraft even flies at night, is synchronized with their social security numbers. Uh, in India, we call them Aadhaar cards. And that they would be immediately identified and caught by a team from the national capital. So not even the state capital. Obviously, these are all, this is all misinformation, but that's the kind of fear that is being instilled when, uh, when, when this technology is being practiced. Uh, this practice changes considerably when the drone is actually flown alongside a village dominated by, say, powerful class groups or upper caste groups. In these villages, the drone team would first call the village headman and ask his permission before flying it. Here, the drone is flown at the boundaries of the forest and not in the village or from within the village. What is interesting here is that the village headman often directs the drone team to fly the drone over areas that are inhabited by marginalized caste groups. And this practice actually has been discussed very heavily in the discipline called surveillance studies, which and it is called a social sorting within, within surveillance studies. Um, I spoke to a senior forest official from this state and uh, asked him why this, uh, why are drones being used in Corbett? And he was very clear that our basic mandate for using drones is to create psychological terror uh, and not, you know, ecological monitoring. Though it is also used sometimes for, you know, crocodile counts and things like that, but it is very little. Most of it is actually used for, uh, you know, law enforcement efforts. Uh, 
to on to the next one so these are a few quotes from some of my interviews uh, relating to drone so there is this first quote on the left where uh, somebody from a lower caste village is telling me what are they trying to monitor by flying the drone where women from our village go to relieve themselves uh, can they dare do the same in the upper caste villages so there are very you know uh, potential caste dynamics there uh on the right you you know the court says that you should see how these baksas which is basically a scheduled tribe in india an indigenous community a very heavily marginalized community they run helter skelter when they see the drone flying over their heads while they are fishing so this is a village headman who's talking to me about the drone team uh there is a woman who's saying when the drone came that day we all panicked um as we did not know what it was it made a very loud buzzing so- sound as if it were a thousand honey bees coming towards us we panicked and ran and my daughter who's two months pregnant tripped and fell thankfully nothing happened to her and on the right a very uh, disturbingly they are talking about another scheduled tribe group or a marginalized group called the one gujars uh, uh, and this is a forest official who's saying that these one Vanju- gujars cannot be trusted they are muslims and have links to kashmir so kashmir as some of you might know is a disputed territory between india and pakistan has very heavy uh, uh, you know importance in the current nationalistic discourse in india uh and and he says that they can do anti national activities and they need to be monitored by drone so you see how like uh current discourses of national level politics also seeps in into uh, when conservation surveillance technologies are being used by the state finally there is this surveillance by the electronic eye system and uh, the, all of these towers that a uh, combination about 11 towers that are deployed on the southern boundary of the copper tiger reserve and they face an adjoining state so india has different states and uh, copper tiger reserve is a state called uttarakhand while the towers they are facing uh, the southern boundaries uh, the, uh, it shares with the state called as uttar pradesh uh, and uttarakhand actually came out of uttar pradesh in the year 2000 so two decades before uh, due to an ethnically uh, linguistic kind of a revolution and resistance movement uh so this is how the uh, display of the electronic surveillance system looks at, like and this is from the di- the field director's office so on the left is a colored vision and on the right is a thermal vision and you can actually zoom in and see into people's homes on the other side of the national park as well uh, through that um so there are some quotes here uh, where uh, somebody from uttar pradesh is saying what is the meaning of directing all those towers towards us uh, can't there be Sushant. any intro sorry just yes. to just yes. to sorry to interrupt your slide hasn't flicked on would you be able to Ooh. move it on so we can um this is super can interesting you... i'm so sorry to to interrupt your role yeah that's that's fine so i was saying that there is uh, you know through my interviews that this very interesting quote that came up uh, from somebody from the uttar pradesh side of uh, the border of the cobbet tiger reserve where they're saying what is the meaning of directing all those towers towards us can't there be any intrusion from the northern boundary this is the politics of showing us down so the electronic eye is perceived by the people of uttar pradesh as a, a symbolism of showing them down because there are no electronic towers on the northern boundary the justification for this that forest officials would say is that this is where most of the intrusion into the tiger reserve happens from uh, but you know during the discussion we'll come to the intrusion uh, again um so there's also a quote where they say that uh, you know somebody again uh, from the other side of the border say they say the cameras have night vision and can see all the way into our village forget being uncomfortable while collecting wood in the forest i'm now uncomfortable in my own village my own home um right wait i'm just going to skip through this because that's not what i'm going to so uh, as my research shows conservation surveillance technologies have a wide range of social and political implications obviously these are very context specific and my research is just based out of cobbet uh but my work shows that uh, conservation technologies can exacerbate already prevailing inequalities of gender caste and class discrimination and uh, conservation surveillance also triggers a multitude of resistance responses by various groups so uh, when you have such negative perceptions towards conservation surveillance there are obstructions to the views as well camera traps get stolen they get uh, you, you know destroyed sometimes uh, just lit, you know fires are lit towards uh, when camera traps are put on uh and then so there are sometimes dedicated movements as well that uh you know can obstruct people's use of these technologies um yeah i guess i'm done so um lords next maybe we, uh, steph if you want to take questions we can take some questions now well. yeah there's a couple of questions that was really interesting um thank you so much um there's a lot of really uh really good comments in in the chat but um carly did you want to jump in and ask a question uh 
yeah hi um that was really fascinating stuff and I loved the like gendered perspective that you that you made um is there so what are these all like the forest guards are they all like employed by the government and is it like regional government or national government are there like other NGOs in the area or is it just like this what like what are the like layers of power that are kind of overseeing this? That's a that's a very good question, Kali. Uh, so Corbett Tiger Reserve is part of what's called Project Tiger and it comes under the central government. So forest guards are employed government employees of the central government. So they are uh, they are basically the state. So they are government authorities. They are the lowest level functionaries, uh, but they are the they are as good as they're looked at as government, uh, you know, law enforcers. So uh, just like police constables, forest guards role, play the role of uh, policing uh, and you know doing law enforcement around protected areas in India. Okay, and are there any like local like is this all a government led thing or is are there any like bottoms up kind of local ngo type inv organizations so, involved it seems like the best kind of stuff happens when like that is the case yeah so it's uh, again very interesting that uh, you know uh initially uh you know and it, it actually in most predicted days around india uh a lot of these technologies are actually introduced by ngos uh, um first uh, only recently, we've been seeing a trend in India where NGOs are, uh, you know, increasingly being sidelined uh, from doing camera trapping, especially when it comes to tiger reserves. You know, so you know, uh, tiger reserves are, you know, a, a politically very charged areas. Uh, you know, they garner votes. There is a lot of discourse, especially when it comes to tiger reserves. You know, one tiger death and the entire news media goes berserk. So. Uh, you know, increasingly, you know, NGOs are being sidelined in these areas. So, but particularly in Corbett Tiger Reserve and most national parks or like that have tigers or are project tiger sites, it is the government which does the camera trapping. Uh, the NGOs are not really involved. So, and that's actually very important when it comes to deployment of surveillance technologies is that the state is in power. You know, the state has the final say. So even if there is an NGO that is doing uh, camera trapping work, they are actually bound to give all their data back to the government. Uh, and there have been many cases where NGOs have come across, uh, you know, if they've got pe pictures of people and if they do not want to share that data or if there is a picture of a tiger that they don't, and sometimes they don't share these images. And that becomes, again, very politically disadvantageous for them because then the government can just say, okay, you're not going to work in this area anymore. So uh, the NGOs are under a lot of pressure as well when, uh, when you know, when they are doing uh, camera trapping or using drones uh, in, in, in these landscapes. Uh, Rob, did you want to ask your question? Uh, hi, Trishan. Uh, it's just such a frightening, um, eye-opening uh, revelation that you, you're presenting. I've literally never thought of it, you know, along these lines, so it's quite terrifying. My question was, um, from what, what are the laws that they're supposedly enforcing with all these technologies? Why, why are they specifically using them? in that sense that's that's a very good question uh, rob so uh, it's tricky so you know the boundaries between uh, so supposedly this is this is a national park and all our national parks have what's called a core area and a buffer area most people forget that there are a large number of people that live sometimes inside these protected areas or in the fringes and they are legally allowed to go and collect forest produce in the buffer areas now, what happens is that uh, the state, the forest department, uh, uh, is particularly not very keen of people going inside because it becomes very difficult for them to manage such large areas in terms of law enforcement. What are the laws that they're actually trying to enforce is that they are not, they're trying to not allow people go inside core areas or uh, they just want to kind of limit people collecting the number of firewood say, for example, they always say there's a risk of poaching when people go inside. But, you know, these laws are actually very gray. And these areas, these, uh, you know, this area, there is no kind of strict boundary. There is no sort of a wall or a fence that separates a buffer area from a core area. These areas are very fluid. 
so it becomes very difficult for local communities also to kind of uh, you know determine what is buffer area and what is core area because traditionally they've been practicing resource collection for many generations so as i as i said and i demonstrated through my work a lot of this actually you know when it comes to uh, enforcement of law or when it comes to kind of uh, prosecution of people it comes from uh, entrenched inequalities within the society so uh, you know p- so for example a f- upper caste forest guard inherently tries to kind of discriminate against lower caste people collecting forest produce or indigenous people collecting forest produce so it there is a long history of conflict between marginalized communities and and the kind of uh, forest department in india which uh, and and these conflicts kind of stem from that so uh, I, I, kind of answering your question what are the laws that they are trying to enforce it's basically restricting people's movement inside protected areas uh, but the, again those laws are also very gray you know there is uh, there are some 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 places it is legally allowed some places it is not uh, and it becomes very difficult to differentiate the two when on the ground yeah oh, i mean it's just such an it just sounds like an awful situation where law enforcement is actually you know a big part of the problem it sounds like because i imagine that there's not a lot of alternatives for these people in terms of finding produce etc like there's no mm-hmm. alternative ways for them to do these sorts of things i i would suspect mm-hmm. all right well thank yeah, you I'm... very much prashant yeah one one last question uh Dan, did you want to jump in? Sure. My question was just uh I agree with everybody else this is a fascinating discussion and even if even if these issues have trickled across our minds this is by far the most in-depth uh survey of this area that I think I certainly that I've ever seen and everybody else seems to agree. Uh, I missed it maybe on your first slide somewhere you said has this been published are you planning to publish this just, or is there a link we can point people to because we want to have the same conversation in 100 other discussion groups. Right. Um so I am in the final stages of writing up my PhD and have plans to publish multiple papers that will come out uh, uh, very soon, um, hopefully in the next uh, six to seven months. Uh, so I'll definitely, uh, you know, share to the, the wild links to those forums. papers. Yeah. Yes. Post to yes, wild labs uh, when you're sure. uh, when you're when they're up. Yes, but uh, also there is recently I did a plenary talk for the drone ecologies conference, and that's a more detailed. Uh, uh, kind of a conversation around this where i particularly talk about conservation surveillance being used as a, a repression tool by the state uh, so um, and that i mean i can i can i can just e- email the link to steph and that she can share on the wild apps group um yeah no 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 uh, oops god i'm having some technical issues no uh chashant you are a yeah. member of wild labs so you can actually oh yes i can do it myself you can actually yes. start a whole discussion all about your research and host it uh, in the community <laughs> yes, that's a good idea, Steph. As soon as I'm, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Um that was that was fantastic. And we're going to pick up uh, I know there's a lot of discussion happening in uh the chat and I'm going to pick it up in the panel discussion because I think um the questions and comments that are being raised are actually going to be partly answered by our next two speakers but also should be covered by everyone. Um uh <laughs> um okay we're going to hand over to law now um and uh, speakers uh, i'd also encourage you if you have the mental space to just keep it keep an eye on the chat and you might um be able to pick up some of the questions in there as well laura are you good to take over i am i am doing the the technical tricky bit as we speak um there we are Doug's already in the chat. Love it. Dropping links to papers and suggested uh, principles. Okay. Can you all see this? <clears throat> we can. Uh, and still. All right. So thanks a lot. Uh, this was yeah um humbling, humbling presentation to to follow so just a little bit about me uh, my name's Lor i'm a technical specialist on the wildlife trade team at flora and fauna uh, international the Conserv- international conservation ngo uh, and previously um, i trained as a social scientist and i carried out a phd on the implication of digital technologies for the management and protection of conservation sites so that's a, a topic that's really um dear to my heart as it were and and it, yeah it's it's really exciting to be part of this panel and and this discussion um so what i um uh, want to do is highlight some tools and procedures that are already in use in international ngos and that are of direct relevance to um 
applying the responsible use of tech principles that Doug, Doug mentioned in, in his talk at the very beginning and avoiding some of, the, well, hopefully preventing some of the really um, damaging uh, uh, implications that, that Trishan's just um, described. Um, so what what I am um, what this is inspired by is uh, a work, some work by uh, myself and my colleague Sarah Glushek. Um, we've taken direct inspiration from the existing literature and debates and um, um, the paper the um, papers that Doug mentioned in in the introduction to create uh, a synthetic version of this for advice um, to our colleagues in FFI who might be using technology against the illegal harvest and trailed, tr um, trade of wildlife. Um, so, for example, um, using technology to monitor, investigate, and deter illegal activities such as um, such as poaching, but but not limited to it. And what we've tried to do is link to familiar and existing resources that could guide applications. So I'm going to give some examples uh, of this just now, um, focusing on, on law enforcement oriented users, because I know Koshtub's going to share his experience of, um, of um, sensitization and, and um, thinking through these issues for biodiversity monitoring just, just afterwards. Um, so the first principle that I uh, wanted to touch on was um, deploying technology based on necessity and proportionality uh, and just um, one thing that we've highlighted for our colleagues is, is the importance of being clear on the purpose of technology deployment and maintain a clear distinction between biomonitoring and, and law enforcement because the practical ways of, of, in, of implementing responsible use uh, principles will, will differ depending on the aims, um, but also Trishan, Trishan's just shown um, the, the really damaging difficulties that can arise when, when there's unclarity um, around the exact uses and aims of, of the technology. Um, so so is, is, is the technology you're thinking about, be it a drone, a camera tap, um, you know, network sensors, um, is it the right option? And, and these are tech questions that will generally be asked at the stage of, um, of developing a theory of change for, for conservation um, uh, project proposals or statement of need. Uh, so the, these are things that that are being done anyway, and it's just adding a, a layer of, of questioning and of consideration around tech. Um, and if it is for law enforcement, you know, um, advising on or supporting law enforcement by by um, relevant authorities, can the technology actually deliver the the stated aims? You know, if it's about informing prosecution, can your camera trap take pictures of suspects that it can be used in these contexts and that are clear enough for that? Um, if it is about uh, informing the deployment of staff, can uh, uh, you know rangers or local conservation staff receive the alerts and actually respond to them? Um, and if it's to deter um, illegal activities, will it? You know, is there a risk that it, it will create um, displacement to a, to a nearby area or um, um, similar activities? The second principle I, I, that is in, in, in Doug's and, and Trishan's and colleagues' papers that I wanted to um, um, talk about a bit more is evaluating the impact of, on people in advance. And uh, that can be done through a process that is sometimes used on um, projects in, 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 well, very often used on projects in, in, in geos is social impact assessment of the positive and negative social and economic um, impacts that a, a, a conservation project will have um, and very often depending on this the this, this size of the NGO there'll actually be members of staff that are specialists of asking these questions and using different methodologies to to answer them um, and I have to point out here as well that depending on on this the the donor it will also be a requirement um, and and to have a better understanding and awareness of what the likely impacts will be, it's also really important to keep up to date uh, um, of emerging debates and research, and that's what we're um, doing just now. So, and you know, it's 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 a first step on on um, doing these uh, the, these evaluations ahead of time. Um, and you know, if 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 you're coming from the position of an NGO supporting or advising on the use of tech for law enforcement, it's important to understand ahead of time if technology will actually collect information about 
marginalized, marginalized groups disproportion disproportionately uh, if it will collect information about groups that are actually not involved in the main um, illegal activities that are of interest and concern, um, but also if the deployment of tech will um, will um, exacerbate social and political conflict because none of these things um, in the aim will in the end will contribute to protecting wildlife and it might even be uh, counterproductive even when talking about um, law enforcement. Um, the third principle that I wanted to touch on was building transparency and accountability um, as well as disclosure into the use of tech um, and uh, that's that's important uh, as well when it comes to law enforcement activities. It might not processes that are that are the gold center for engaging with local residents and um, gathering content uh, such as fake free prior and informed consent um, processes might not be appropriate or relevant when it comes to law enforcement, but it's still um, uh, valid, valuable, and important to. Um, to inform residents of the, the deployment and purposes of, of um, surveillance devices that might be in the landscape, as well as where they can uh, reach out to for um, grievances and, and um, um, complaints if, if they have any. And, you know, um, that engaging and informing residents about the 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 results that have that are obtained that have been obtained is it's is still um, possible um, even when when uh, it's for law enforcement purposes. Uh, last but not least, protecting data in order to safeguard privacy. Um, Trishan's just touched uh, during the question part on the legal obligations that are associated with handling and um, and sharing data on potential illegal illegal activities that might be detected. Uh, it's it, either intentionally or uh, by accident. And I think it's really important to have an awareness of these legal obligations before deploying technology, but also assessing carefully whether whether it's pos whether it's possible and desirable to share these types of information with um, government bodies, depending on on their practices and the way they operate. Um, so that's that's for consideration beforehand. Um, but of course, during and after uh, a data management management plan is something that. Uh, every every um, person doing a, um, a survey or handling um, digital data will have. Um, so it, it could be a case of just adding a layer of consideration into um, privacy law and good good sensitive practice for handling uh, images of, of people, such as we've talked a bit about deleting images or filtering them out. Um, it could be deleting images of people that are unrelated to to law enforcement or not suspected of of, of uh, any illegal activities, um, but it could it it also relates to assessing access and security of the the data store storage um, systems, um, as well as uh, deciding on how long images should be kept um, for 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 these law enforcement purposes. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, as as it's been said before, this is very much an evolving uh, conversation, and these are some some suggestions for um, applying principles. But I'm I'm really keen to hear ideas and and um, experiences from from the audience about um, ways to apply these principles in in other sectors or other ways that they've already e experimented with successfully or or unsuccessfully for that matter. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. That was awesome. Um, I have a question to to kick it off, kick us off. I yeah. know this has only been quite recently um, uh, developed, and I mean, uh, spoiler everyone. I also work for FFI, so I have um, some involvement here. But I was wondering if um, I was wondering how you're finding uptake and socialization of these sort of guidelines and whether you're getting any pushback um, or uh, any concerns about incorporating is is this viewed as how are you overcoming is, is this viewed as more um, paperwork or more more oversight that's unnecessary or is it viewed as something that oh this is helpful and okay this is a process I can build into my 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 project that's um, going to um, have a really good impact and, and what's your been your experience there 
So I think I think that'll be a really, really interesting thing to discuss with with people in, on this call, um, because there's definitely a sentiment that it, it is a night added layer of, of um, investigation, data finding and, and thinking um, while preparing projects that are and, and that's putting that on people who are already um, kind of drowning and, and reporting and, and uh, trying to keep the timelines and so on and so forth. Um, so that's why we've tried to synthesize the existing literature, but also uh, myself and colleagues are seeing that as much as a, um, a kind of reminder for ourselves in conversations that we have with uh, teams that are actually implementing projects. So to kind of have not make this additional pipe paperwork, but make this a conversation. So these yeah. are in a conversation to make sure that it is included in the paperwork later on. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a separate set of paperwork, I think is our, our thinking for now uh, on this. Yeah, um, it, yeah it's, it, you and I have talked about this, but it's quite common. It's It, it has a lot in common to our approach at Wild Labs for um, designing events, for example, and making sure we have equal representation of, of men and women. And it's not like it's a box we tick, though we do track those metrics. It's it's more of a, a, a thought process and a way we approach planning rather than a, OK, I need to add this layer of process into my like and write this report about it. So um, I think it's a really uh, it's really helpful to hear from you about how you're developing guidelines and how you're trans taking the work that um, is coming from academia and this really like really important research that Trishant was sharing and Doug and Chris have been spearheading and translating that into actually what does that mean for a practitioner who is just trying to like work on the front lines and and is super stretched so thank you. Um, if I can just add though a, yeah. a point uh, building on what uh, Doug mentioned earlier I think uptake by donors would also provide a bit more of an incentive um for, for practitioners it's my in opinion. terms of in terms of requirements in terms of it being error? required rather than ideal scenario okay interesting um talia did you have a question yes um thanks so much for that presentation super interesting and it's great to learn that uh ffi is really considering this and building in frameworks for accountability i was just wondering are you aware of any other similar efforts by environment NGOs or is FFI kind of the leader in this space? Is there opportunity for shared learning um, from other organizations? I don't want to claim leadership when <laughs> I'm not. I think these are this is yeah we keep repeating how this is very very much an emerging field um, and it so happens that there's a few people at FFI who are very sensitive sensible to it and informed uh, I'm sure it's the case in other NGOs, but I guess for now it's not being claimed and, and publicized. Um, and so I couldn't really tell you how, how far these debates have progressed inside other large organizations. But maybe people on this call can. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll find out. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, let's pick up. Carly, what are you... Oh, sorry, go Carly. What are you like? Are you are you? Do you just mean like? Do other organizations have guidelines or like what? Like what are you specifically well, talking I, about? I know that WWF in the past year or so has adopted new social and environmental safeguards. Um, yeah. And so I know it's something that a lot of other major organizations are considering. For sure. But I don't know. I don't know about like whether conservation technologies are specifically considered as part of that. Like I think many organizations, hopefully all organizations have some kind of safeguards process for working with local communities and indigenous groups. Um, but it's like, are we specifically considering the impacts of conservation tech? Since it seems like a lot of people in the conservation tech world ourselves aren't considering it as much as we should be. I know from, okay, yeah. I, I know from um, the, like just the Wild Labs partnership, uh, it's of consideration for, for all of the partners in our organization, which is like WWF, WCS, Conservation International, ZSL, FFI. Um, did I forget someone? No. Um, no. Uh, but I, I know FFI, in those conversations, it's, it's been one of the areas that FFI has been really, really conscious about. Just it, it's partly, um, it's partly because of just 
how they operate um, and and how closely we work with partners and um, a, a function of that uh, sort of interest. But I think technology is and safeguarding and, and the impacts has been a, a consideration for a really long time. Um, and law's work is just the latest iteration of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's there are there's it's interesting NGO world like it's there are barriers to sharing processes and sharing documentation and stuff so so much work could be going on that we just don't know about so there's there are some barriers there to 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 um, to look at and and some trust to be built and conversations like this are really really important for for just sharing different ways of doing things. Um, okay, I'm going to pause there. Thanks, Laura, uh, Castell. You're going to go next. Do you want to uh, take over? Sure. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, give me a second. Did it work? Stephanie, did it work? Uh, it did. My like, it's got to be my favorite opening slide of any talk we've ever had. So, anyway, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And uh, well, to be honest, what uh, Doug, Trishant, and Laura have just spoken about sort of really re-emphasizes re this quote. Uh, by the way, spoiler alert for Marvel fans: uh, although this quote has been made famous by Stanley Spider-Man. It was a French Revolution in the early 18th century uh, when this uh, quote has is believed to have been coined for the first time. Anyway, the, the reason I invoke this quote today is this. Species such as the snow leopard are so difficult to spot. Had it not been for technology, we'd have still been living with many of the scientific myths that lingered for centuries uh, about this elusive species. And no, I'm not exaggerating about the species elusiveness. Uh, in the photo you see here, even the ibex, whose life depends on spotting the snow leopard from a safe distance, seems to have got it all wrong. As you can see, it's totally looking at the wrong direction. And that's what makes snow leopards snow leopards. Camera traps provide some of the most incredible insights about not just uh, abundance, but also behavior, movement, species richness, and space, uh, space use. Uh, it is su not surprising that the number of publications using camera traps has increased about fourfold uh, in the last 20 years from what it used to be before that. From a taxi driver to the head of a country, the moment they get to know that you, if you are interacting with them, that you work uh, on snow leopards, or you just mentioned the word snow leopards, almost essentially the first question they ask is, oh, how many there are? Undeniably, one of the finest means to assess snow leopard abundance is camera traps. They sit out in the mountains for months at end without complaining about the extreme temperatures and difficult conditions. Uh, but then we can't estimate abundances with just one or two cameras. We need dozens, sometimes hundreds, set up simultaneously across landscapes. And with the snow leopard distribution range spreading over 2 million square kilometers and 12 countries, we're looking at a minimum of 5,000 camera trap stations uh, set up in multiple countries as part of an ongoing um, ambitious initiative called the Population Assessment of the World's Snow Leopards or PAWS, as we call it in short. But snow leopards do interface with human populations and with their massive home ranges, there are few places across the distribution range that humans do not use. Quiet operations, uh, no flashlights, and incre an incredible uh, camouflage provide these cameras the perfect stealth. And with an outstanding capacity to capture hundreds of thousands of photos, Without running out of memory or power, these cameras record everything that moves, including livestock and humans. And these interactions are sometimes funny and sometimes serious in nature. While these images can be an evidence for investigation and prose uh, prosecution, it can catch people off guard and also be considered as a breach of people's privacy, thus invoking uh, the very question of uh, proportionality versus necessity that Doug and uh, Trishan both mentioned about. 
Many countries now have laws and legal frameworks about breach of privacy, freedom of move, uh, movement and personal autonomy, which many times researchers may not even be aware of. Ah, there. Uh, on the other hand, there'll also be times when the researchers might be bound by law or a permit clause from the authorities to report illegal activities. However, it is well known, and Trishan just uh, gave some incredible examples here, it is well known that several conservation programs across the world are guilty of being coercive and imposed top-down, leading to marginali marginalization and injustices. It is rare to see such involvement of local communities and conservation programs as you see in this picture here, which is from the Indian Himalayas. The issue of privacy also ties up closely with that of human rights, where the UN Declaration on Human Rights has reinforced that all humans are born free and equal, and that nobody should be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile. The Snow Leopard Conservation Programs uh, specifically uh, very closely follow what we call as the Partners Principles for Community-Based Conservation. Uh, the extended risks of jeopardizing uh, delicate relationships that we build is not unfounded if a technological solution is used inappropriately. It also puts, at, uh, puts to risk the relationship with the governments or other enforcement agencies because they may expect us to work with them and share information. So what we found during our uh, uh, during the last couple of uh, decades was, uh, uh, in fact, what we also found in some of the review that we were doing that in some countries it's even illegal to remove human pictures uh, from these uh, from automatic recorders, which is more like an extension of existing laws around uh, CCTV. So anyway, the key was to tread the tightrope between ethics and legalities. And it can be difficult. Uh, it also leaves gaping holes that can not only be used against unsuspecting local communities, but also researchers. And there are many and many an example out there where researchers have been subjected to uh, lawsuits and uh, uh, pen penalties uh, from the state as well. So based on our experience of, uh, of a few decades of partnering with local communities, what we did was we tried to enlist seven basic concepts which sort of overlap with what uh, uh, what Chris and Doug and Trishan explained earlier. Uh, and the idea was uh, these basic concepts should be visited every time we are planning to camera trap in a new area. Incidentally, as I mentioned, these concepts co-evolved at the same time when Chris, Doug and Trishan were developing something very similar. While their principles address the broader use, uh, a broader issue of using tech uh, in general for wildlife conservation, we focused a little bit on camera traps because that's what we were using extensively. So in the next few slides, I'll just uh, take you on a quick tour to these concepts in practice. Now, here's my colleague Pooji working with the local community members of South Gobi. She knows that it is totally worth the effort to build trust and confidence through a range of measures that help the local communities understand the purpose of the camera trap work uh, with both authorities as well as community members. It's always a good idea to set up cameras in any area after seeking the necessary permits from the agencies or organizations that have jurisdiction over the land uh, where you intend to work, even though one must keep in mind many times those jurisdictions are uh, have a lot of gray area. Uh, they could be taken. Uh, they could be some uh, uh, force involved in the past or, um, uh, you know, evictions could also be involved there. Anyway, strengthening the participation of communities and research cannot be overemphasized. It actually has added benefits, uh, where in this case, uh, again in Mongolia, the herder partners now lead the field research by setting up the cameras, collecting them, and supporting overall monitoring efforts, even for the state uh, as well as for the uh, NGO uh, uh, which is working there. Increasing dialogue with the local community can also ensure that the camera traps uh, respect the community's privacy. Uh, it is imperative to seek consensus before setting up cameras and not just by speaking only to the leaders uh, because they may have their own uh, issues. And Trishant again explained it very nicely about the power dynamics within communities. Uh, it's really critical to have the entire community's representation out there. And that's when things can possibly uh, be more equitable. 
People can at times be uncomfortable with the presence of cameras in the pastures and it gives them a feeling of being under surveillance, very similar to what you saw earlier. Uh, some even worry, some people even worry that uh, camera traps could see inside the houses several kilometers away. And the only way to resolve these worries uh, has been by working with the community members, avoiding set up, setting up cameras uh, at places that make them uncomfortable uh, and also allowing them the privacy and most importantly, clarifying the purpose of camera trapping explicitly and respecting it. It's very lucrative at times, you know, you've done camera trapping, you've got a lot of information, including some uh, bycatch, and that bycatch can lead to, uh, you know, some uh, some interesting uh, findings. But if, if that involves human images, then that needs to be uh, then one needs to take consent specifically rather than just going ahead and using them. There are times when one, uh, oops, sorry about this one. Uh, yeah, there, there are times when one is legally bound uh, uh, to obviously share some of these images. In these cases, uh, in such cases, the community must be informed uh, that the researchers have a legal obligation to share such images with the authorities and hence ensure a priori disclosure with those people who use that uh, land, uh, who use that space. And then uh, sharing images uh, and information with the local communities goes a long way. As you can see here in a, in a community in, uh, in the Indian Himalayas, uh, it builds trust, generates ideas beneficial to all, including the researchers, and also creates a sense of ownership of your precious cameras among the area, uh, among the area's primary stakeholders, which are the local community representatives. And lastly, we've seen this happen a lot, and Trishant again gave those examples about what all the drone can do, but it can be tempting to claim that your camera has features that don't exist, uh, or your technological solution has some features that don't exist, with the hope that it will prevent theft or damage or will instill fear. But such practice, as, as we've just seen, are breeding grounds for deteriorating trust and potentially greater damage in the long run, uh, both to the relationship uh, between uh, the conservation fraternity and the local communities, as well as equipment. Uh, so ultimately, let's keep in mind that even after all of these uh, steps taken, all of these things kept in mind, uh, some cameras may still go missing. Some may still get vandalized or destroyed, but trust building, as you all will appreciate, is a continuous and painstaking process and is totally worth the cost and the time that it takes. Uh, with that, I'd like to stop here by reiterating uh, what they call as the golden rule to treat others as you want to be treated. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, thank you. Uh... Uh, let me try to stop sharing. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Did um, stop? Carly, did you have a specific question you wanted to ask? Or do you want? Did what? Don't worry. Sorry, I'm. Uh, I was just wondering if that was a question you wanted to ask this particular panelist, or I can move on. I don't know what question you're talking about. Oh, maybe it wasn't you asking it. Okay, sorry, ignore me. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to. I have a. I have quite a few questions for the panel at large. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dan. Sorry, Carly. Um, so, uh, I just. I, I'd like to start by saying thank you so much for for that. Um, for all of those talks. This is uh, universally in our team. Um, just been agreed as one of the most interesting sessions that we've ever run and has just sparked up a lot of um, ideas and and further conversations that we clearly need to have so I think this is just the starting point but for the panel I, I the opening question I'd um I'd like to ask is that you know how Doug you presented actually multiple uh, there are multiple principles and guidelines that have been developed like how do we get to a point of uptake and what are the next steps for for um, encouraging um, 
uh, everyone working in conservation tech to take these issues seriously and 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 follow the principles and um, particularly when donors and official regulations and and everything else is a couple of steps behind the curve how do we how do we push forward with this so you're asking me specifically Steph oh, I think you can take it I, it was to the panel generally <laughs> but best practice would direct it to someone so Doug do you want to take that question first sure I'll try uh, and and others please add because I know that there's some some really good ideas uh, I First off, I'm really heartened by how much appetite and interest there is in the topic from uh, a great diversity of people and a great diversity of places and organizations. So, you know, my my sense based on the converse, the way the conversation is going in the chat and the questions we have is that people are not that far behind the curve thinking about this. Um, it And it doesn't take an awful lot to get people thinking really hard in their own context and and getting really far with it and i i know my I, i've had that kind of light bulb going off feeling at least three times listening to my colleagues and uh, and and seeing the, the the discussion so i think it's it's really pretty straightforward we all try and work um in our own situations with the levers and the opportunities that we each have and we all kind of stay connected and, and see where it can all go. Um, you know, the, the folks who have weighed in on uh, developers and what they can bring to this space. I mean, there's a dead logical next uh, <clears throat> next discussion to have. <clears throat> I'll, I'll stop here. Um, Costa, you've, you've done an amazing amount of work in this space and thinking about working aqu across 12 countries just boggles my mind um in all kinds of ways so you know what, what what you know what are your what are your thoughts here so i'll say it's not been easy and uh, i think it takes time to get your head around that ooh, you can do so much more with it but you you have to kind of pull back so i think uh, it's it's uh, the, the uptake is slow but there have been a couple of uh, ideas that we've been discussing, Doug, uh, if you remember, which is, uh, you know, we, we have these ethical statements made in a lot of papers, uh, you know, for instance, papers that use interview data, right? And they have to follow a certain ethical guidelines. And when they started, it was almost considered to be, oh, you have to do another thing. But now it's become the norm and it is you people have started to realize value. In fact, in, even in our case where we've been working, while there has been an initial hesitance that oh, we have to do this one as well. But the moment you start seeing the value it provides you, it's it's also safeguarding yourself, right? And what if you find yourself in a difficult situation where you don't know what to, you know, I mean, you could be under legal systems uh, clause, or you could be completely, uh, you know, um, uh, spoiling your relationship with the community with which you've been working for the last 20, 25 years. So I think it's a very important point that you, it's, it grows on you, uh, provide once you start understanding what are the values it provides. And a, a lot of times, you know, what we've also realized that people think, oh, this is an add on thing that they have to do. But once you have a discussion with them, they realize that, oh, some of it they're already doing, it's just not explicitly stating it. So the, the purpose here is, here is to have a checklist that you have to make sure you don't forget. You know, when you're going out, you, you check, okay, I have my keys, I have my mobile, I have my uh, house keys and everything. And then you leave. If you don't make that checklist, there'll be someday you'll forget the key and then you'll be logged outside. So here again, you're doing it every day, but that one day you'll miss, forget the key and that'll be a problem. So which is why I think it's a really a, a good thing to, to start thinking in these lines because it's going to save you at the end of the day, uh, as well as of course, the, the larger things uh, in question. Absolutely. Steph, if I can just add one thing Chris has been up to, he's been working with the editors at Oryx and uh, it sounds as though that journal is, uh, very likely to adopt exactly this kind of a statement of principles. I'm actually, I suspect we have some of Oryx, the Oryx team here. I know they registered. Julia or Emma, are you around? Julia, hi. Hi. Yes. How are you doing? 
Uh, good, thank you. Yeah, so I'm uh, Julia, I'm the managing editor of Oryx, and um, we are indeed working with Chris Sandbrook at the moment, as we speak, pretty much, to um, add to our ethical guidelines that we have published on our website a paragraph about conservation technology. Do you I think am very much um, involved in that at the moment. Uh, do you see it as something that um, other journals will pick up as well? Hopefully, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they will. Awesome. Thanks, Julia. Uh, and thanks for letting me put you on the spot. Um, uh, one of the, uh, oh, uh, Talia, did you want to add anything in about um, the question you raised in registration? Sure, yeah, just briefly. Um, so I was pretty much asking, like, do we need, so it seems like from our research we've been doing at Wild Labs that this is something that a lot of experts are considering and doing really good, important work on, but that kind of the average user and developer aren't considering so much yet. Um, and I was wondering, like, kind of like you alluded to, do we need like an IRB for conservation tech ethics, or is it more of like a cultural shift? And what do we need to get there? If so, is it just more conversations like this? Or do, do you think it needs more kind of regulation, like having those checklists available um, for that cultural shift to happen? Maybe a bit of both, if I may say so. Because uh, one may not be enough and there'll be ways to bypass it, right? So maybe mm -hmm. if I may just say a little bit of both. Uh, it's like, you know, it's, it's a, I mean, with, with conservation, at least community-based conservation, what we do say is that one solution may not really get you there. So you need a suite of uh, activities, right? A suite of uh, programs. So I think here as well, you know, that's what uh, I think Doug and Trishant and Chris and I, we've been talking about, let, let's let, attack it from all possible directions because then then only it'll become, uh, it'll become visible. And once it's visible, it'll be difficult to ignore it. Uh, at the same time, you know, it, it should just get imbibed at some point in time. All right, thank you. Did we lose Steph? No. Oh yeah. God, no. <laughs> what is happening with teams it's, today? He's just showing a giant camera. For oh, it's fine. It's our it's uh it's our colleague who's joining from the middle of the um jungle, so he gets a pass. Um, uh, so uh, thanks for that. Um, um, one of the things I I wanted to come back to, and I think Shah, you. Steph, I think you're muted. Guys, okay. Um, uh, Teams is just not my friend today. Um, one of the things I wanted to throw to you now was um, was actually, I wanted to throw to Shah and actually possibly um, Thao and Dan, if you're here as well, it would be really interesting to hear from you. And it's the, the aspect that we've got a really fantastic panel here bringing in... Um, bringing in practitioner and academic and and international NGO perspectives, but we don't have the tech industry and there's a role to play. Uh, and a lot of the principles that have been developed are very focused on users and and uh, what we're doing with the data after the fact. And I think there must be a role, way more of a role for the tech industry to play. And also possibly, um, I know this is a conversation that's been happening in the tech industry as well for, for years. And, and I wonder if there's ways that we could be learning from what you guys are uh, taking on and having to deal with or whether conservation has a role to be actually pushing um, far ahead and we have a bit more uh, uh, responsibility to do so. So Dan you've just turned your camera on so I'm going to throw to you but Shaf and and Thao also feel free to, to jump in. My, my only first thought I'll chime in with actually really isn't a tech industry thought it's more of an academic thought that I think we all know like the it's probably been the last 50 years, if you submitted a, a, a paper to a medical journal without having it reviewed by an IRB, it was just like rejected out of hand. That That's like all before the time of anybody on this phone call, that's been the case. It, more recently, even in some computer science fields, like in human computer, human computer interaction, which does a lot of human subjects work, a sort of part of that community, when it transitioned through that, when it was like, there was a time when you could just submit and say, "Here's this is what we did, take it or leave it. And then at some point it was like, the major conferences just said 
we're actually going to start rejecting your papers if you don't cite a reputable IRB. And wow, did people respond really quickly to that. Um, and I, uh, I don't know that it could, I mean, that was a really smooth example, but like I clearly, I'm glad that somebody brought up the, that's beyond guidelines. That was like, it was just a community getting together and basically in the span of a year was like, if it doesn't go through a respectable IRB, you know, there's still a lot of leeway on what a respectable IRB is, but um, I, I apologize. I, I, IRB is an institutional review board. I shouldn't assume that like that's, that's a, an ethics panel for medical tip historically for medical research, but more recently for all human subjects research. Um, that's something maybe this community wants to consider also that it's up to the community to figure out what, what it is and what our equivalent of an IRB is, but it's largely journals are the enforcement mechanism. Uh, and wow, wow, is that an effective enforcement mechanism? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's helpful. That's not me. That's me responding as a computer scientist, not as a tech industry person, but something to think about. And just before I give the panel a chance to re respond, Shah, I know you have to go in two minutes. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, oh, good. I uh, I have a meeting. Um, so my my question was, you know, for all the obvious reasons, this is all very much focused on camera trapping and drones, anything that takes imagery, but you know as a tech developer in the broader tech development community there are really great conversations of, like about the ethics of data ownership and kind of access to data there's a lot of really great stuff around ai and the use of ai for these sorts of things and i would be interested in in um seeing some of this work migrate outside of just uh, purely the camera trap world and start thinking about conservation tech in general, us leaving devices in other people's backyards and yeah. what that means for um, just the way that we do it, how we engage communities, uh, what happens to the tech after we leave. Uh, all, all this stuff is very much tied to the ethics of conservation technology and, and it's something that you know I'm, I'm very interested in. That's all, all I had to say. Is there anything our panel wants to pick up on there? Steph, I'll jump in. <clears throat> so, so Shah, there's a there's a whole lot of discussion about that in a very very broad sense in the Canadian context uh, about research with Indigenous communities. Uh, the researcher Indigenous community relationship has not always been very good, <clears throat> and uh, there's been uh, some very very strong and uh, very positive um, and productive pushes to improve that. There are a number of um, of uh, sets of principles that have become adopted more broadly. OCAP is the big one in uh, in Canada. Uh, that that acronym stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession of Data. Uh, and that is really, uh, as a framework for thinking about it, that's really revolutionized um, the thinking about these relationships and the data dimension of it. Um, you know, just across all fields, medical. Um, biophysical science, social science, uh, humanities. So I'm going to put a link to the OCAP principles up. Uh, and we do see a whole lot of this also in research permitting processes now. And it, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's not over. It's a very, very live ongoing discussion. Uh, and the, uh, the, the level of um, the, the greater and broader engagement in the discussion, um, the more uh, the more useful and the more practical and the more effective those principles are becoming. Zoe, I know you've got thoughts on this in this space. Do you want to jump in? You've been dropping in some really interesting comments. Oh, I should have checked if you had a mic. Ah, 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 there you are. Yes, something came on. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, it's really been a very interesting discussion and I actually came into this thinking it was going to be about animal ethics. So I've kind of landed in slightly um, unknown territory, which has been even better. Um, and I just think, um, you know, a lot of the kind of ethical concerns regarding communities that we come across um, seem to me to relate to how much those communities can participate in the work instead of just being kind of observers or people who should be um, kind of, um, you know, considered in ethical terms. I think that long term sustainability does um, come with true engagement in perhaps the science as well as, as just, you know, the fact that they're not being intruded into. Um, and, you know, we, we work a lot with 
people who have this fantastic traditional ecological knowledge. And I think that to be able to engage that and deploy it brings sustainability, it brings engagement, it brings sometimes jobs, um, finance, it brings in a whole range of factors into the into the equation. Um, and, you know, we've kind of been thinking about this over years. It's kind of come into us, um, you know, from field experience rather than any specific ethical position. Um, but it does seem that that is really um, something that we could all explore more is, is trying to figure out what these communities have to give to conservation that we're not currently using. And I think, I mean, personally, from our, our tech position, you know, our tech was developed on the basis of traditional ecological knowledge. But I'm sure local communities have many other gifts that we, they could bring to conservation that we're not currently engaging. And I think a little bit more of that conversation would bring us all big benefits. And, but I'd be really interested to hear what other people think about that, whether they've come across that as well. Any thoughts from our panel? I'd like to hear from uh, from you know really all of the other panelists. I've got a ton I could say, but I'll just put one brief thing in the chat, and I would love to hear from others uh, about their experiences and their their thoughts here. Steph, I'd love to answer, but I lost the voice somewhere in between. So I don't know the exact question. I'm so sorry. Zoe, was there a particular question you wanted to to throw to to the panelists? Well, I guess just just kind of putting out um, a feeler to see if other people have experienced this idea that um, you know the ethics of engaging with local communities could be improved even further if we engage their traditional ecological skills into our tech protocols. Um, rather than just having to make sure that they're kind of not upset by what we're doing or disturbed to actually say, OK, you know, you guys actually have something very valuable to offer. You know, all sorts of things that we don't know. I mean, how do we engage that um, to make them feel more included, but to actually bring their skills on board to improve what we're doing? Steph, wait, I, no, no, wait, Carly, wait, <gasps> panelist, and then I'll throw to you. <laughs> Gustav, do you want to do you want to take it off? Yeah, I mean, this spot on uh, to what we uh, I think I was trying to also mention earlier. The amount of value the community can bring in by the their knowledge uh, about the areas, about what they feel can be done with some of the existing and upcoming technology, uh, you know, tech solutions, whether it's cultural, whether it's uh, something that uh, they believe can work. So I, I think you know the key here is rather than going and uh, you know telling them this is what we want to do, the whole partners approach is you know engaging with them, being treating them as, as equal, and then you come up with you know you co-evolve ideas, you co-evolve uh, even questions many times. And as I mentioned, you know some of the the questions that. Uh, our researchers have been able to develop by working closely with the communities are absolutely are completely out of what they had started with mm -hmm. and that happened only because they you know they had they had full faith in the ability of the community to to also help them move forward in a direction which they would have had no clue about so i think i mean i'm i'm, I'm totally in agreement uh, with the suggested comment that it definitely helps. I mean, in, in our limited experience, it certainly helps. Carly, did you want to jump in now? Yes, I like I think you forced down my hand. I did. Uh, <laughs> I was offended. Um, no, that well, it was what Doug said too. like I put in the chat that what in response to what Zoe was saying, I think COVID has basically forced that like community participation to be the norm because we can't go like Doug said it much more succinctly that parachute science ended with like COVID because we literally could not get there and the only reason that my research was able to keep going was because we had trained staff in Madagascar at the local research station who could yeah. continue like we would wire money to the research station 
they would continue deploying the I do passive acoustic stuff. Um, and that like we could actually continue. And so I think one COVID has, I don't know if there's some like really messed up silver lining, uh, that's one. Two, properly acknowledging the these people as well in like well I shouldn't say not not just putting them in the acknowledgement section and actually recognizing their contributions properly is like yeah. I always include my field team as authors or at least ask like some of them don't like some actually don't want to be author like they don't want to be on the papers so one just ask but to like I always include my field team and they're that is like not the norm which shocks me that like so many people just like are like oh yeah we thank like these people in the acknowledgement sections who actually collected all of the data <laughs> and so yeah that those are my thoughts uh, I would just give a little plug for some research we've been doing into both the state of conservation tech and into responses to COVID and how technology has played a role there. The the research into the responses with COVID um, uh, and, and those sort of comments came out a lot through focus groups and 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 survey results. So, I mean, Talia, you can jump in and it's it's your research. Um, but uh, yeah, the the, the COVID um, we saw that that comment come through broadly. Um, I'm really conscious of the time. I swore that we would not go out over an hour and a half and yet here we are, but I am giving us a little leeway because we had some technical difficulties. Um, but uh, I really feel like this is actually just the start of the conversation and I really want just want to thank everyone for being so willing to participate and engage and, and ask such interesting questions and I mean it's uh, a testament to the the all of our speakers, the the um, work that you've brought in front of us to share has just been incredible. So um, just to say that next week there is, um, we have a community call, which is going to be more of an open discussion and sharing um, some results from research that you've been helping us with and give you a space to talk about Wild Labs and and hear about the programs we're planning and, and help shape them and, and feedback. Um, but before I finish, I just want to give um, everyone on the panel a, a, a chance to have a last comment. Like, what do you think next steps should be or what's your main takeaway from the, the call today and or or a call to action that you'd like people to take as a next step? Um, oh, who should I call on first? Trishant, we've not heard from you. And and yours was the the like your talk was incredible. Um, what what's what's your main takeaway or call to action? I think. Uh, uh... I mean, it's great to hear from everybody else, and um, I'm I'm so glad that this this conversation is happening. I think uh, my main call to action would be uh, proportionality. Uh, you know, sometimes I think tech uh, is really not necessary in certain places, but it is still used. Uh, and I see that uh, many a times, especially in certain places in India, where it is about the spectacle rather than really the data. So uh, some some places where you really don't need to use drones, the the NGOs come forward and introduce these technologies to the state, and then the state uses it the way they want to use it. So uh, I think there is, uh, you know, as as uh, Kostuk said, and it was mentioned in the chat, the platinum rule that uh, treat people as they want to be treated. And uh, I think that's really, really important when it comes to this, that we should really stop, uh, you know, be very careful about proportionality. Is your tech really necessary? And if it is necessary, it needs to be done with proper safeguards that have been discussed by Costa uh, Douglas and everybody. So yeah, I guess that's my call to action. Thanks, Trishant. Laura, what's your main takeaway or call to action? I think my main takeaway has been that even though the, you, the discussion's still starting, people are already doing it without necessarily realizing it or doing it, but it's not, I mean, not necessarily been shared that widely before now. And so it's really exciting to hear about everyone's experience and definitely have noticed some ideas that I'll, I'll be taking um, to colleagues and, and saying, you know, this is actually possible and, and being done. So yeah, it's been great. Awesome. Doug, do you want to, what's your main takeaway or, or call to action? My main takeaway is that uh, things are moving faster than I thought, and there is much more going on 
Uh, and, you know, just hearing from others on our team, Laura, we haven't had a chance to connect before. Uh, and I was thrilled to hear uh, how your organization is operationalizing these principles already. I mean, I'm uh, I'm seeing a lot of very, very positive and exciting signs. And uh, my call to action would be just to urge uh, urge continuation of this discussion and dialogue and some of the larger issues that Carly and Zoe and others have and Ellie have touched on uh, can help this accelerate too. And as well, some of these these um, situations and developments in this space can, I think, probably have some outsized impact on uh, uh, on research or community relationships much more broadly than just conservation uh, and and certainly geographically extremely broadly. Thank you for this. This has been great. And uh, final word goes to you, Kasav. What would you? Uh, what were your main takeaways or your final call to action? I think. I mean, it's it's already there, and people are already doing it. But just to reiterate that uh, respect and transparency in uh, what we do, especially in areas which which has people using it, governments stakes there you know these these are multi-use landscapes i think respect and transparency is the the key and uh, if we maintain that then you know it, it, it's a better world for all of us you know it's easier uh, and uh, as we saw some examples you know research continued despite nobody being able to go to the field just because you know the staff was trained and we have similar experiences in at least four of our uh, study sites where none of the field teams could go there so I think, you know, have transparency, respect and having faith in in their capabilities. What a fantastic way to finish. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, that's a wrap on today's session and hopefully just the first of, of many to come. Um, th uh, thanks, everyone. Um, if you want to hang around every week after Tech Tutors, we stop recording and we just have a, a, a casual chat about tech and life mostly about tech um so everyone's welcome to stay um but otherwise uh please join me in thanking our panel and um we'll see you all next week mm -hmm.